Hey, Reboot family, you know, after walking through the Valley of Trauma with hundreds of people, I found there's actually one secret weapon that can make the difference between surviving and living life to the fullest. And today, I'm going to share what that secret weapon is with you and show you how you can start using it in your life right away. Here we go. The Reboot Recovery Show helps listeners overcome trauma and mental health challenges. Thousands have already experienced healing by applying what they learned on the show. And now, it's your turn. Welcome to the Reboot Recovery Show, where we are overcoming trauma together. Lori is here with me as always. We're broadcasting live from the Reboot Recovery headquarters here in Tennessee. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you're a first-time listener, hopefully you're going to find today encouraging and edifying. Hopefully it'll you know, challenge you a little bit, make, make things a little bit better for you. You know, there isn't a shortage of treatments to help people heal from trauma. Sometimes when I'm, when I'm around my clinician friends, I hear them, they almost sound like a walking eye chart of acronyms, you know, EMDR, CPT, CBT, uh, you know, somatic response therapy, all these different things that sometimes it can start to feel like, well, we just need to chase these different treatments and maybe one of them will be the magic key that unlocks healing for me. And, and for some of our listeners, they may, have, they may have experienced that. They may have finally found a therapeutic modality that worked for them. And if that's the case, that is awesome. But for some of us, we still feel like there's something missing, something not quite right. You know, billions of dollars also have been poured into medications to try to help with things. And again, some people have found help in that, but some haven't. But in my experience, again, this is my experience, I've found that there's one secret weapon, which is usually a key factor in determining. It makes the difference between people who just exist and people who thrive. And here it is. The secret weapon is community. It's community. In my experience, this is the factor, the, the leading factor that determines the long-term health of someone is their willingness and ability, how much they're participating in authentic, loving, trusting relationships. What if the key to healing is found not in some uh, groundbreaking new thing? What if it's found in maybe the, the most time-honored tradition of all, friendship? And how does this actually heal? How does this actually go about? So we're going to talk about that because trauma makes it really difficult. Uh, you know, there's so many reasons that when we go through something traumatic that we tend to pull away from people. And we're going to talk about that. And, and also the people who are in our circles, let's be honest, they just may not get it. They may not understand what we've been through. And so it's difficult for us to feel like we still view life through the same lens that they do, making it even harder to develop those deep senses, those deep ties of community and friendship. So, but first, I want to jump over to Lori. We're going to take some questions. My favorite part of the, the, the show, the podcast that we do, we're going to go into some of these questions. And, and Lori is in the middle of her Whole30 diet yes, yes. right now. Yep. And she had a dream last night. What was it you were riding? A, riding a bike through Sloppy Joe's. Riding a bike through Sloppy Joe's. So, you know, I think this could be an interesting analogy for trauma. Like, man, if you're if you're at home right now and you feel like you're riding a bike through Sloppy Joe's, you're not alone. That's, yeah, everybody, yeah. <laughs> everybody, at least everybody on Whole30. <laughs> everybody's been there. Yep. So mm -hmm. let's get into it again. If you have questions, uh, find us on Twitter, on Facebook, at Reboot Recovery, or email us at show at RebootRecovery.com. And Lori, where do we want to start today? All right, here's the first question. He says, due to an injury, I deal with chronic pain. I feel like I've lost who I used to be. I was always very active and enjoyed getting out and staying busy, but now I just really just sit around. I've gained weight and I'm just sick of myself. What advice would you have for me? Yeah, this is how I feel every December. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding with you. Thank you for your question. I think um, the first thing I would say is it's okay to grieve that loss, right? So when it sounds like you suffered some kind of injury specific that, that took away ability, um, and sometimes that can kind of create a snowball effect, right? I can't do this. That was a, this was a trigger a lot of times for me being able to do this. Like a good example would be I worked out to deal with my stress. I can't work out anymore, so now I'm anxious and stressed all the time. Now I take medications to deal with my stress and anxiety. This makes me feel sad and depressed. You know what I mean? It just kind of creates a snowball effect. So first off, it's healthy to slow down, pause, and actually grieve that loss, to name the things that you lost by name, to say I lost this ability by name. And to grieve that because that begins the process of grieving, which allows you to begin moving forward. Without grieving, you run the risk of actually getting stuck in the past. And there's nothing more depressing 
than constantly looking back at the glory days saying those were the days my best days are behind me and my current and future life looks you know dreadful there's nothing worse than that so you don't want to do that second though i would just think out loud here is you know it might be good to check have you allowed this injury thing to actually start impacting your identity and how you see yourself and your purpose was your identity based uh, on your abilities and your skills beforehand? And now those have been ripped away. And part of what you're struggling with is who are you? Um, and I think when we base our identity in those sorts of things, when they are taken away, it gives us an opportunity to really ask God and to ask those around us, who am I? And to really go deeper and to discover who am I if you took away those those accolades and those special talents because you're more than just those abilities you know you're not what you do uh you're you're more than just your actions a, a combination of your actions um and third i would i would say this is maybe trite but start where you are and do what you start where you are and do what you can um you know there may be things that you can't do maybe you can't go run a 5k anymore but i'll tell you what you could do maybe you can take walk, walks around the neighborhood and you can go and walk and meet a friend for coffee maybe you can can uh, I mean, I, I don't know what your limitations are, but there's something that you can do. So start where you are and do what you can. You know, it wouldn't make sense for me to instantly go in and try to run a triathlon, but I could start by going to the pool and swimming a few laps, you know, uh, which I'm not going to do, right. but I could do if I was so motivated, <laughs> right? And so those are just some ideas. Um, beyond the physical... Um, sort of a mental side of things. It sounds like there also might be an element of um, spiritual thing going on here too. And just that feeling of feeling sick with yourself, I think, was that the language he used? Something mm-hmm. like that. You know, that, that concerns me a little bit because um, that sounds like you're devaluing yourself and that's not the way I see you. That's not the way that God sees you. Um, you know, it, it could be that God's actually revealing something incredible through this season in your life. And, uh, and it could end up being a time you look back and say, man, I'm so glad I went through that. It may not be, but it could be. Um, and so I would just say that, uh, that when, when you see these doors closing, these opportunities closing, you know, look at what other skills and abilities might be able to be drawn out of you. Maybe you have a gift of encouragement. If so, encourage. If you're a writer, then write. If you're a fill-in-the-blank, then do, start doing that. Use this as an opportunity to almost audit a bunch of other skills and abilities and find one that you might be able to find some joy in. And, uh, you know, it's kind of a blessing in one way if you think about it that way. you got a chance to go try lots of different things and figure out what, what sparks joy, to use that, that Netflix term. Mm. So I hope that's a little bit helpful. Um, as you do this, hopefully you'll begin to sort of retrain, re, re, uh, reframe your trauma um, and start to discover some good things that are coming out of it. So, yep. But don't be sick of yourself. I'm not sick of you. Those around you aren't really sick of you. And if they are, they hopefully aren't saying that. But, you know, at the end of the day, you can, you can start where you're at and you can start doing something. And that should uh, give you a little bit of a spark. A lot of times all we need is a spark to start a fire. Yep. All right. We've got one more. She says, how can I forgive the person who caused my trauma? A sermon at church was about forgiveness. Ooh. And I feel like I should forgive, but I can't. First off, uh, that's awesome that you're feeling this conviction, this need to forgive, I would say, because uh, that means that not only you're in, you know, you're in tune with the Holy Spirit, you were present and listening, uh, but it's also that you're open-minded to doing hard things. Right. And, um, y- you know, the thing about forgiveness is, is that if we wait to forgive until we feel like forgiving, you'll be waiting forever. Because forgiveness doesn't ever feel good. You know, offering forgiveness to someone or asking for forgiveness or giving it, it's not a super easy process. It's hard by nature. And so one question I would ask you, though, is what is your motivation behind feeling like you need to forgive them? Why do you want to forgive them? And this is a deep question that a lot of people don't ask. They just think, oh, I want to forgive him uh, because I think it's the right thing to do. And that's a good answer. You know, another answer might be, I forgive because God forgave me. And so I feel like it's a, you know, as I'm forgiven, I forgive others. That's a great answer as well. I love that, right? A person who's been given grace should be gracious. A forgiven person should be a forgiving person. I love that. But I think it's sometimes even deeper. Sometimes we need to ask the question, why do I want to forgive this person? And so as you start to get in that, you'll start to uncover these layers that allow you to see the person as God sees them. It might start as, I want to forgive him for my own benefit because I'm tired of carrying this weight around of unforgiveness. 
If for no other reason, awesome, do that. But it could be that over time you start to say, I want to forgive him so that he sees an example of Christ's love. See how that's another layer. I don't know if you'll get there. You may not share my same worldview, and that's okay. But I think that, that um, as you talk about this and ask that question, you'll start to see those different layers. And again, forgiveness begins with a choice. You make a choice to forgive. You, you do faith, facts, and feelings in that order, not feelings first. If you do the faith and the facts piece and you do forgive them, uh, the feelings will eventually, eventually come to some degree to some degree. Uh, And there's a real simple formula I I recommend for forgiving people, which is to really just say this, you know, God, today I choose to forgive this person's name, not because it feels good, but I do it as an act of obedience to you because you first forgave me. And sometimes I'll even tell the person that, that I'm choosing to forgive you, not because I think you deserve it or earned it, because I'm doing it for my own benefit and I'm doing it because that's what I believe I was forgiven. And so I'm now sharing that with you. That's a powerful testimony. It's something that, that will change the person um, and sometimes make reconciliation possible depending mm-hmm. on how bad the, the trauma was. Um, now, if that's unsafe, do not go and ask for reconciliation for that person. Um, or if it's not possible, if they're dead or, or in prison or something like that, then that's okay too. So um, I think, is that all the time? That's all the time we have for <sighs> questions today. Bummer. Maybe we should just do questions one day, a whole episode. Maybe we should. That would be a good idea. Yeah. Just questions. You know, when we come back after this short break, we're going to be talking about the secret weapon of community and how that can help you defeat trauma and experience lasting healing. We'll be right back. This episode of the Reboot Recovery Show is brought to you by Highline. 10 days, five friends, one trek across Utah's Uinta Highline Trail. This feature length documentary follows five hikers through the mountains as they find adventure inspiration, and healing from life's hardships, including drug addiction and PTSD. Visit HighlineFilm.com and follow Outmersive Films on social media for more information. Welcome back to the Reboot Recovery Show. Welcome to all of our first-time listeners. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you've not missed an episode yet, as well, we wanted to thank you. Uh, if, if you're enjoying the episode, could you go ahead and leave a comment or leave a review for us? Those really help us and help us reach more people, which ultimately we're all in this together. And so you can, you can help fulfill a, a purpose and reach someone who's hurting just by doing that. You know, today, as I mentioned, we're discussing this topic of community. And it's truly a secret weapon that can help us uh, keep from getting stuck. It can help us sort of defeat the initial harms or some of the harm that trauma has done. You know, so it's as simple as just go find a group of people that you enjoy being around who love you and care about you and who are going to wade through all the messiness of your trauma and be best friends with them. Just that easy, right? But it's not that simple. I mean, you know, Everyday people who have had not suffered trauma have a difficult time with friendship. Right. Add in trauma on top of it, and it just it's a, a life experience that's very difficult for most people mm-hmm. to relate to. And so that further compl- complicates it. Not, not to mention if you've dealt with trauma or have a mental health challenge, finding this community can be hard because you don't like crowds. You're probably distrusting of people initially because of some of your trauma. And, I mean, so these are complex layers that really add into things. And ultimately, a lot of times, at least in cases that I've witnessed, it makes people pull into their shell, almost withdraw within themselves. And they begin to pull away from people, sometimes people who are good influences in their life. Isn't that a profound and interesting point that trauma actually makes us pull away from sources that would likely be able to help? And I think this is one of the the age old tricks that that in in the Christian belief systems at least I think it's a tactic that Satan uses that when we experience trauma in order to give that trauma long term control over various aspects of our life he begins to isolate us to pull us back from people who would be able to speak truth and encouragement and life into situations that are dark and scary and a person who's alone in a war whether spiritual or physical is more easily picked off and more easily defeated. You know, uh, I've, I've been a drummer and a musician my whole life, and so I played drums a lot growing up, and unfortunately I didn't wear proper hearing protection. And so I, when I lay down at night, when I'm all alone, when it's quiet in the house, I begin hearing this ringing in my mm-hmm. ears. And if I tune into that ringing, pretty soon it becomes deafeningly loud. They call it tinnitus, I think mm-hmm. is what it's called. 
And a lot of times as we start to isolate ourselves from people, what happens is we open ourselves up to hear voices that are not helpful, voices that are evil and destructive, that bring a, bring death and defeat and depression and destruction into our lives. That's a lot of D's in a row there. That's a good alliteration, right? So it's, it's vital that we make every effort to find this healthy, helpful, and loving community. Because, you know, I've, you'll often hear me say, you can't be the best version of yourself by yourself. You can't be the best version of yourself by yourself. It takes others to help you get there. And if you're hoping to heal from trauma all alone or just with you and your counselor, your counselor is not your friend. They don't love you in the same way that a friend will, simply because they can't. There's a patient relationship there. There's funds that are exchanged. It's a different dynamic. And so finding people who love you just for you is something that is necessary. You know, that's why we say on this tagline that we're overcoming trauma together because it takes us helping one another. That's why when you submit a question... It's, it's not just for you. You submit it for the whole group. Every listener gets to help one another. And someday, God willing, we'll go to a situation where we could have live, on-air discussions mm-hmm. and questions. But, but we're not there today, unfortunately. Right? Um, so what does a healthy community look like? What does it look like? It's one where you feel safe. It's one where you feel valued. And it's one where you feel challenged. Safe, valued, and challenged. You know, uh, it takes intentionality on all parties for community to form. If you want it and they don't, it's probably not going to happen. If they want it and you don't, it's probably not going to happen. It takes intentionality on all parts. You know, we teach our boys, my wife always says to our boys at home, she says, uh, to, to my oldest especially, she'll say, no, you know, it, it, sometimes you have to be a friend to have a friend right. or to get a friend. And I think that's such a, a good basic teaching. Sometimes you have to be a friend first to get a friend. And when we're wounded, sometimes we feel like everybody should meet us three quarters of the way or, or whatever is above three quarters, you know, <laughs> four fifths of the way. Um, but reality says you'll probably have to go 50% or more for the first initial relationship. Sometimes you have to be a friend to have a friend. So my question would be is, if you're looking for community, if you're in alignment, you say, Evan, healthy community could be a secret weapon for me that I really don't have after trauma. Are you being a good friend? Who are you being a friend to? Even with your limited time, I'll tell you, there's a a friend in my life that she writes notes of encouragement to people in the midst of her pain. And that's extremely moving to me because she can't do much physically, but what she can do is she can sit in bed and write some notes to people. Are you being a good friend? Do you have a good community? If not, here's some things that I would suggest that might be able to help you start finding that community. So first, write down a list of people's names that care about you. You know, it's amazing because some of us might only have one or two names or we, we might think we have no any, we, we may think we don't have any names. Uh, and others will come up with 15 names right away. And that's okay because all of us need a different number of friends. Some of us need lots of friends to do a little. Some of us, we're okay with having one or two lifelong friends, and that's all we need. And that's okay. That's okay. But, but write those names, and the, 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 list, the length of the list doesn't matter. It's the fact that, one, you need to tell yourself there's people who value you, who care about you, who love you, and who will challenge you. And then write those names down and then say, are these people truly helping me become the best version of myself? Are they helping me or are they hindering me? And, you know, some of you, I want you to hear me. Some of you, you have a community, but it's the wrong community. It's the wrong community. You're surrounded by people who are going nowhere, and they want to keep you from getting anywhere. Let me say that again. There's people in your life who are going nowhere, and they want to keep you from getting anywhere. And you see, those people, they, they aren't community. They aren't challenging you to be the best version of yourself. In fact, they might be pulling you down to their level in order to enable their poor decisions and behavior. And some of you all, it's, it's time to break off of that community because that community enjoys being stuck with you. And you'll notice them because they talk about all the reasons they can't move forward. Well, if once I have this, then I'll be able to do this. Well, you know, the VA didn't do this, so I couldn't do this. Or a friend of mine did this, or my wife won't do this. There's always a reason they can't move forward in their healing journey. These people aren't helping you. 
In matter of fact, they're often holding you back from becoming all that you can be. And listen, as long as you are a passenger in, the, in a parked car, you're not going to go anywhere. You're not going to go anywhere. You know, or even worse, if these people are continuing to traumatize you over and over again, they're not just keeping you where they're actually making your life worse. And, and I trust me on this, you'll end up finding yourself in a hopeless situation. And even them, in their misery, they will abandon you because misery eventually, if you're a bitter person, if you're an upset person, you get upset at even other people who are like you. Don't make that mistake. You know, there's nothing uh, more depressing, I think, than if I hopped in a road trip and they said, where are we going? And he said, nowhere, but we're going to sit here for the nine-hour drive nonetheless, right? And that's sometimes how we invest our time. We spend hours and hours and hours with people playing online video games or, or watching movies that don't add up to anything. And we look at, how did I spend my time over the last 40 hours of work time that I could have done, or hundreds of hours a week, and I say, well, it didn't add up to much except for I got a new high school on whatever game I was playing. That, that doesn't add up to a whole lot. And so we want to use our time wisely. So number one is, you know, again, uh, build a list of names and contact and, and ask yourself, are those people helping me be the best version? Number two is go to those people and say, I want to move forward and I need your help. I want to move forward. I need your help. One of my friends, Lara, she always talks about functioning forward in spite of her chronic pain. And I love this idea of functioning forward. It's not jumping forward. It's just learning to function and keep moving forward a little at a time. And what you can do is sit down with them and say, I want to move forward. I need your help. I'm giving you permission to ask me hard questions. I want you to challenge me, but I need you to tell me that I'm valuable to you. I need you to do this. And in shame, I'm going to do the same for you. You see, it's like a bank account. If you just took withdrawals, eventually that relationship becomes bankrupt. So you got to make some contributions into your friendships as well. In spite of that trauma, you got to use your, your whatever you can do. Start where you're at. Like I told the guy earlier in the, in the show, you got to make some deposits into those relationships as well. Because none of us like to have a friend who just every time they call, it's like, what are they going to take from me this time? And sometimes as people who have gone through trauma, as hard as this is, we don't have much to give. So we just want to take and that is a, a risky thing. Now, some of us, we're so, self, we're so sort of self-isolated um, that we, we don't take from anybody either. And that's, that's starvation, right? That's not good either. Now, with these conversations, when you sit down, you write your list, you say, are these people being helpful? To, do they make me the best version of myself? And number three, you sit down and say, I'm moving forward and I want your help. You may never have a more awkward conversation than you have with these people. It is really uncomfortable to say, will you be my friend? <laughs> it's very uncomfortable, but it will be worth it. And you know what? You'll start moving forward. And all of a sudden, when you start moving forward, the trauma gets further in the rear view and you start to, to gain some different perspectives and you start to heal because I'm not sure healing is necessarily the absence of symptoms. Healing may be just a perspective difference on that trauma as well, Right. So what if your breakthrough after trauma or mental health challenge isn't found through some emerging therapy or pharmaceutical innovation? What if it's found in friendship? What if it's found in friendship? What if the healing that you desire is found through others investing in your life and you, in turn, investing in theirs? So go build that community, deploy that secret weapon. At the end of this podcast, take five minutes, write down some names and text those people and say, thank you for being my life. I'm moving forward and I want your help. You know, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this. Make some comments here on whatever social platform you're using or email us. Um, I'm interested to see as you start to reach out to these relationships and you make investments, do you see a return on those investments? I'm excited to hear about that. And if you've, if you've had some friends who have let you down in the past, uh, do your best to forgive them as our second uh, question was about today, but don't let those burned bridges keep you from making forward. P p pick an alternate route, you know, pick an alternate route because if you've been burned by friends, you're not alone. Uh, all of us have it one time or another, but keep at it. Don't give up. There's a community who needs you. There's a community who needs you. They need to learn from your experience uh, and together, I know, I just know that we can overcome trauma. I fully, fully believe that. So thanks so much. In the meantime, if you feel like you're riding a bike through Sloppy Joe's, you know, <laughs> remain hopeful and uh, life's going to be good. So thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Reboot Recovery Show. The next episode I'm really excited about, we're, we're going to be talking um, about finding purpose 
after trauma. So many people feel like they lose their purpose, they lose their motivation, they lose their drive during tra- seasons of trauma. I think it's going to be really, really good and encouraging to some people. So again, thanks so much for joining us. See you next time.